Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do is give a, a bit of a summary of where I think we're at in Victoria in terms of, of goal exploration. Um, it's, it's not going to be comprehensive because as you'll see, or many of you may know already, there's a lot of activity going on in Victoria now. And I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that have developed over the last couple of decades that I think will inform this next phase of exploration in the state. So uh, I would like to acknowledge some of my collaborators in the past, particularly Frank Beerlein, uh, Stafford McKnight, and Emily House. Um, I would also like to acknowledge uh, a number of funding organizations that over the last few decades have facilitated a lot of the research, some of which I'll, I will be talking about today. And of course, I've collaborated with uh, workers in a number of universities over the years. Not so much anymore since I've, I've been out consulting. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about, uh, certainly work that I've been involved in, uh, goes back uh, quite a few years. But I, I don't think it's changed much in the last 10 years. It's probably good with a lot of new people coming into Victoria to look for gold, just to recount some of the work that's been done in the past. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the Renaissance and geological thought in Victoria, because I think that can inform how we go about exploring in the state. Uh, and I would then like to talk a, lot, a bit about the resur resurrection of exploration in Victoria. It, at times, things have been pretty quiet in Victoria, and we have these waves of activity that are tied in with the rising gold price. But this most recent uh, resurrection of exploration has really been driven by the discovery of the swan load at Fosterville. And since then, um, we've had a bit of money that's come, come into Victoria, uh, and that has led to a few more discoveries, not a whole lot of resources coming through just yet. Uh, hopefully, we'll start to see some of those coming through in the next few years. But what I would like to focus on in the final component is I'd, I'd like to look at uh, some of the oddities in Victoria, and, and um, I don't have any clear thoughts as to what they might mean, but I, 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 I do like to point out that Fosterville for many years was considered to be an oddity in central Victoria, and it's turned out, as the name indicates, it's turned out to, to develop into a, into a swan. So uh, some of these other unusual plays, and particularly in eastern Victoria, I think are, are worth a mention. So let's have a, a look at some of the things that have developed over the years in Victoria. Uh, this, is, this is not a particularly new concept, this concept of structural zones in Victoria. It's been around for quite a while. Probably the, the thing that's been added to it is the recognition that we've got a block of Proterozoic basement rock. Uh, part of the northern portion of a microcontinent that extends down to Tasmania, and uh, where it underlies central Victoria, it's known as the Selwyn Block. And, and the outline proposed by the Geological Survey of Victoria is shown here in this dashed line. In addition to that, I've drawn another dashed line, which is the approximate boundary between Lake Devonian and uh, and older granite rocks. So you can see it's roughly similar in places, possibly not well constrained in, in every uh, locality, uh, but it, it mirrors somewhat that outline of the underlying Selwyn block. Shown in the, the bright red stars are uh, operating gold mines um, at the moment in Victoria, and you can see the majority of them are in central Victoria. And we've got one over here that's just started back up again and stalled. So these structural zones have, have been known for quite a while. There's been a little bit of juggling of boundaries and the understanding of what those boundaries are uh, has evolved over the last few decades. Uh, but this is more or less the tectonic architecture that's been inherited for, for Victoria. No, one of, I, one of the, the, I think, major developments in thinking in Victoria is the oral clinal model that is, has been developed 
uh, over the last decade or more, which is an attempt to try to explain that architecture that we currently see. And if we go back to the order of issue, what, what is thought to have happened is this microcontinent known as Van Dyland uh, has got caught up in an accretionary complex. It's, it's basically uh, plugged up the sub subduction zone and, and forced during trench retreat, forced a wrapping of that accretionary belt uh, around that microcondent. And if you keep your eye on these yellow areas, this, these are the Ordovician uh, turbidite fans that host the majority of gold deposits in central Victoria. You can see that that gets wrapped around. So that, that, that's actually the Tabarabra zone. Uh, we're on just about sitting in at the moment. I'm, I'm just across the border in the Omeo zone where I live. Uh, but that is conceivably part of the Bendigo zone that's been wrapped around during the Paleozoic. And what this has meant in terms of stress fields is that we've gone from predominantly east-west compression to, to a north-south compression locally in the northern part of uh, particularly the, the Melbourne zone in central Victoria, and then back ultimately into east-west compression. And, and here, here on the far right, you can see the, um, uh, the final picture as it's interpreted by uh, Morrissey and and co-workers in 2014. The, the other concept that I think is quite important in Victoria is this concept of mineralogical domains. And you can see there, there overlap, but for the most part, they appear to mirror the structural domains that I discussed previously. And they're characterized by different mineralogical and trace element assemblages to indicate that we do have a range in, in terms of the composition of gold deposits in Victoria. Uh, and a particular note is the overlap of the Costerfield Stibnite domain, uh, and, and the name says it all. Uh, so these are Stibnite bearing deposits overlapping some of the pyrite, the more classical um, central Victorian goldfield style mineralization dominated by pyrite and arsenopyrite. We'll, we'll come back to this at the end uh, of the presentation and, and just speculate a little bit on, uh, on what this overlap might indicate. Now, one of the things that's hampered our understanding of gold deposits in, in Victoria has been a, a, a paucity of, of good geochronology on when the deposits were introduced. I, I was involved in some of this work uh, 15 or 20 years ago. There, there hasn't been much done recently in this space, in part because of the difficulty of getting good samples. And even if you can get a, a well-constrained geological sample, uh, getting appropriate material from it and being able to get a, a good number out of it is still a challenge. So for example, at Fosterville, uh, where some of the mineralization is hosted by uh, felsic dikes, uh, we did attempt to try to get some uh, zircon grains out of those dikes. Um, and you can see uh, from some shrimp analysis on, on individual spots in those zircon grains uh, shown on backscattered images that we do have zoning. Uh, we have some inherited cores in the zircon and then we have younger rims. So, so they don't provide a, a great constraint on the emplacement of those dikes, although they do suggest a Devonian age. And, and if we look at a, um, a whole rock, Argon 4039 uh, plateau spectrum, um, you can see our original age estimate was 381 plus or minus two. Uh, that's been recalculated recently by Dave Phillips and, and his uh, colleagues. Well, not recently, 2012, 10 years ago now, I guess, um, to 383.6. So the, the point is we, we have evidence of, of uh, younger mineralization. And then at Bendigo, probably the best single constraint on the age of gold mineralization is a rhenium osmium age on pyrite and arsenopyrite associated with the central Deborah line of reef. Uh, that gave uh, um, a, a good 
isochron age of 438 plus or minus six. But there is still a lot to be understood about gold mineralization in Victoria. And I think in particular, the exact timing constraints at Fosterville remain elusive. We summarize this or the available uh, geochronological data in 2003 in the, in the gold chapter in uh, the most recent edition of the geology of Victoria. And I won't go into it. It's a very busy de uh, diagram uh, with a lot of detail. But uh, effectively, what we proposed was that there were three windows of gold mineralization in Victoria. Um, the first window occurred during the uh, Benambra neurogeny approximately around 440. Uh, and that fits in with that rhenium osmium age I described just previously. Potentially another window uh, in the early Devonian, uh, possibly associated with the Bindian and Bounding uh, orogeny. Uh, not particularly uh, well defined, possibly related to some remobilization during the emplacement of, of uh, early Devonian granites. And then we have a third window, which includes Fosterville, as well as the Woods Point Dyke Swarm. They came in in the later Devonian, possibly associated with Tabaravra and Orogeny. So that was the really the main outcome of, of the work that we did um, 20 years ago now, uh, more than 20 years, which was the recognition that we had multiple episodes produced in Victoria. And we'll we'll tie that back to some of the mineralogical domains um, uh, when we get towards the end. Now, uh, going back to that oral clinal bend model and trying to put that in into a, a chronological sequence associated with gold mineralization, uh, this is a, a paper that attempted to do that uh, recently and and describes the stress regimes that would have operated in different zones and different gold fields uh, through time and how those stress regimes will uh, would have changed during time and how that would influence the gold bearing structures that we see. So if we think back to the Benambra in that latest sort of issue, early Silurian orogenesis, Potentially, well, we know uh, we see the introduction of gold in the stall zone. Possibly, and this is where the geochronology is, is lacking to support some of the interpretations, uh, but possibly we may have had an introduction of gold at that point at Fosterville. Uh, but certainly, and because we know felsic dikes have been mineralized at Fosterville, and, and those dikes are likely to be of Devonian age, we know that we had later gold introduction as well. So possibly some in the early Devonian and some later in the late Devonian, potentially associated with the Tabarabra and Orogeny. And that includes things like the Costerfield stibnide associated mineralization. So that Costerfield stibnide mineralogical domain is a later overprint on previous gold mineralizing events and uh, it also has a very distinctive geochemical and mineralogical uh, characteristic. And I've thrown in as well because they're, they're, they're quite nice diagrams, uh, some cross sections from the Ballarat gold field showing the interplay between the actual axial surfaces of regional anticlines uh, with cross cutting faults in controlling the distribution of gold mineralization. So if we step back a bit and think about what this means in terms of overall metallogenesis, uh, we know we're in an uh, accreted terrain. So uh, definitely we're going to get orogenic style gold mineralization. Um, a few years back, in fact, um, uh, one of the earliest references to it came out in 1998. That was at a, a gold conference held in Ballarat. And uh, David Groves proposed a continuum model whereby we might see a spectrum of geochemical characteristics associated with orogenic gold deposits, depending on the depth in which the deposits form. So for example, Fosterville, I, 
again, considered to be a, an oddity, um, would be interpreted probably as an epizonal gold and tuning deposit. And, and we know that it was probably in place at a shallow depth compared to more typical orogenical deposits because uh, there's, there's evidence of boiling in the fluid inclusions, um, of which I'll be careful not to say too much because I see Terry Murnau's turned this, and he did the work. So, uh, so again, a, a different fluid than would be typically associated with orogenical deposits. But that's not the only environment where we can get that gold arsenic antimony association. We could also develop these style deposits uh, associated with magnetism or intrusion related gold deposits. So I think in, in Victoria, we need, to, we need to extend our thinking a little bit beyond the classic origin of gold models. Well, uh, there, there's always a controversy as to where the gold comes from. Uh, I think it's pretty clear in Victoria that it's likely to have come from a, a thick sequence of Cambrian basalts. These have been uh, imaged on deep seismic lines that have been done in Western Victoria. And so the, the Cambrian mythic volcanic rocks are shown in light shaded uh, gray area here. And they've been structurally thickened immediately to the west of the selling block. Here's a photograph of, of what some of these basalts look like, uh, where they're more accessible, in this case at, at the uh, Stahl gold mine. But also work that um, has been done indicates that, well, the basalts themselves are not enriched in gold. In fact, they may even be depleted in gold. Interflow sediments associated with this mafic volcanic sequence are enriched in gold to the tune of several hundred parts per billion. <laughs> so it, it seems likely that this, this mafic sequence with its encapsulated interflow sediments, uh, that whole package is uh, potentially a source for auriferous fluids at depth during metamorphism. And then it can move up along some of these major um, uh, fault structures closer to the surface. But it probably doesn't come up the, the main faults themselves because the general observation in, in Victoria, or at least in central Victoria, is that the gold mineralization is typically not found, found on major faults. So one of the one of these major structures is the wide law fault, and the Bendigo Goldfield sits um, to the west of the white law, white law fault where it daylights in the hanging wall. And it was proposed some time ago now that the inflection, the point of max maximum curvature of that fault, is perhaps the point at which fluids are driven off into the overlying. Um, stratigraphic package. And if that's the case, if, and this has been modeled in 3D now, if, if our, our major structures are in yellow here, we can define an area of maximum flexure on the, uh, on the underlying fault structure as being a pr prospective corridor along which we might be looking for uh, gold deposits. And I'll show you an example a little bit later on where that appears to have been very successful. Uh, I like the, the classical fault valve model, um, but I like it with a bit of a, a twist added into it. Uh, again, the concept with the fault valve model is we might have a first order fault along which we generally don't find major gold deposits, uh, but we can have second order faults and as our fluid pressure builds within a system, the fluid can be forced into more permeable portions of, of, of the stratigraphic sequence or the, the host rock pathologies. So uh, in orogenic gold deposits, that's going to be uh, structurally disrupted um, sequences. It could be slightly more permeable sandstone units. And, and that fluid has an opportunity to 
interact and we will have some some wall rock interaction and alteration of those zones of, of higher permeability but at some point that pressure builds to the point where we get failure on the first order structure and and then this line here which is the fluid pressure in the adjacent wall rocks for a brief moment exceeds the fluid pressure within the fold zone itself and all the fluid rushes back into that second order structure uh, potentially triggering uh, deposition of quartz and precipitation of, of gold out of solution. Uh, I do I do want to make clear that I, I don't think the gold necessarily has come from from these rocks. It, this doesn't have a scale. Perhaps if it was um, a large enough scale, that couldn't be the case. Uh, but going back, and I always like to quote a, a fellow named Don, surname Don, who back in 1897 and 1898 published a couple of papers on uh, the Central Victorian gold field and also um, the South Island of New Zealand gold fields and, and defined uh, a zone of gold enrichment around some of these structures around known gold deposits in which gold was enriched in disseminated pyrite, um, which formed a halo around the, uh, the actual deposit itself. So if you like, uh, that's one of the earliest alteration studies that I could find uh, pertaining to the Victorian, central Victorian gold deposits. So when it's closed, we build up pressure, we interact with the raw wall rock, and then we rupture and that, that fluid leaves the wall rock. What we're seeing in terms of alteration uh, that forms during that interaction is uh, really a, quite a simple alteration. Uh, at, at about 20 years ago, when I first arrived in central Victoria, I was told there was no alteration associated with these deposits. And certainly in fresh rocks, it can be very difficult to see. Uh, it's much more evident in a uh, weathered diamond drill core, for example, or in, in, in uh, Moloch if it's been brought up to the surface and had a few decades or not even decades, just a few years to oxidize. What we see are a variety of things. We see a sulfide um, halo around the structures enriched in, in gold as Don indicated uh, well over a hundred years ago. Uh, we see enriched arsenic, sulfur obviously and antimony. Uh, associated with those disseminated sulfides. Uh, we get a short wave infrared signature, which tends to be a muscovitic composition, as opposed to what I think is the background, more of a thingitic illi composition. Uh, we see it also geochemically. If we have uh, good quality geochemical data, we can calculate a, a, a muscovite saturation index. And we also see the loss of sodium due to the breakdown of detrital plunging place grains, with, particularly within sandstones. So being able to track this alteration depends very much on the rock type that you choose to, to study. And then the widest and more, most extensive alteration that we see is a ferroin carbonate halo, uh, colloquially referred to in Victoria as carbonate spotting. Uh, it's associated with the loss of chloride, uh, the introduction of CO2, which we know is present in the ore fluids from fluid inclusion studies that have been done. The timing is complicated because we see evidence for pre, sin, and post cleavage development carbonate spots. Um, so to me, that just indicates that we're dealing with long lived structures that have been active at various times during compression. And we can end up with defined uh, halos around some of the major central Victorian gold deposits shown here and defined by both gold, arsenic and antimony. And, and even deposits like Bendigo can be defined by having a, a, a fairly pronounced enrichment of antimony around them. And we're seeing that now that we have better analytical methods we can get antimony analysis now down to sub PPM level, whereas uh, uh, 20, 30 years ago, we had very high detection limits for antimony of five or 10 parts per million. So we wouldn't have seen any of this uh, in the past. And this is what it looks like after staining. Um, 
this is an extension vein at Fosterville, uh, staying with a mixture of, of potassium ferrocyanide and alizarin red. The, the blue indicates the presence of anchorite. It's lining the extension vein. And then the remaining remainder of the vein has been filled with quartz. And if we zoom in, you, all you need is a hand lens uh, and have a look at some of the wall rock adjacent to that extension vein. Here's the carbonate spots that I mentioned, and it's associated with disseminated pyrite. And that disseminated pyrite will have elevated gold, arsenic, and antimony in it. So we can pick that up through whole rock analysis and uh, ICPMS. We could also potentially pick it up with handheld XRF. And having accumulated data from around a number of central Victorian gold deposits, I feel quite comfortable in concluding that that ferrone carbonate is associated with mineralization. So here's the plot of distance to mineralization uh, plotted against total iron carbonate determined uh, using a quantitative XRD analysis. So this is a combination of siderite and anchorite. And you can see that we get some pretty good numbers as we get proximal to mineralization. And if you look at a plot of chloride, XRD chloride against that total carbonate, you can see in just about every example aside from Bendigo that the association of arsenic, which I'm using as an indicator of proximity to mineralization, is generally elevated in those samples having very little chloride, but a lot of ferroin carbonate, except at Bendigo where we do have chloride bearing samples that are enriched in arsenic. This alteration potentially will have an effect on the density of the rocks. It, it's subtle and uh, it remains to be seen whether this can be uh, defined using uh, um, high resolution ground gravity surveys. Well, but what I've done is I've, I've used some uh, typical percentages of different minerals and, and rocks, again, uh, from work done in uh, quantitative XRD analysis of rock samples around gold deposits and compared it to what we would typically see in an altered sandstone. And we should see a little bit of a bump up in the bulk density of those rocks. Uh, another bit of an oddity that we see at Ballarat in, is um, if we look at some high logger data, and in this case, um, I'm looking or presenting the thermal infrared uh, from one particular drill hole at Ballarat, and we can look at uh, things like albite abundance, and we can see when we get close to mineralized structures, we tend to lose our albite. Um, quartz is picking up, carbonate is picking up, uh, and uh, for some reason, not clearly understood at this point. The kaolinite is also increasing near these structures. And it was originally thought that this kaolinite could mean deep circulating meteoric groundwaters. But I, I would argue if, if you um, look at some uh, mineral stability charts that contain some of the alteration minerals characteristic of a variety of, of hydrothermal deposits, but we don't necessarily need groundwater coming down, what we might just have is we might be starting somewhere in the Muscovite stability field. And then as we cool, we'll drop down into the Candite clay field and eventually into the stability field for kaolinite. So it could indicate some cooling of the system following gold mineralization. Uh, just some other things in terms of technological advances and exploration in central Victoria that I've been working on. Uh, Back in 2011, I did an orientation survey in the Yukon in Canada, looking at a variety of different grain size fractions for gold analysis. Uh, the, it's, it's a problem everywhere when, when you have nuggety gold, what grain size to analyze and how much to get a representative analysis of gold, in this case, from the stream sediment, but also from, uh, from soil or uh, from rock. And in this case, I, I looked at uh, conventional minus 80 mesh, uh, conventional leg, on, but done on that minus 80 mesh material. And then we looked at something relatively new to be made commercially available, and that's to look at the clay fraction. 
and the, the short conclusion from the study is the only fraction that provided repeatable results from field duplicates taken from the same sites was the clay fraction. So that service is available now in Australia from Lab West, and uh, at least two companies in Victoria that I'm aware of have been working on this. Uh, at E79, we used it to, to do um, analysis of residual bedrock in the Beaufort area. And you can see that we've been able to map out these trends of elevated gold, arsenic, and antimony uh, at Beaufort. Um, not necessarily related to the position of historical uh, workings, uh, none of which had any hard rock production, I might add. Um, so these look to be stratigraphically controlled. And Kalamazoo has been working uh, with the clay fraction analysis at uh, Tarnagala and also at Castle Maine. And here's a nice map that I pulled off their website or a conference presentation where they they plotted up gold only in the clay fraction uh, to the north of the poverty reef and developed a nice uh, linear trend. Um, they on, all be based on a small survey. Another technique that has been uh, it's been around for a while. It's not particularly well understood, and that's the concept of mobile metal ions. Certainly, uh, as this diagram indicates, there are a variety of mechanisms that could transport metals vertically to the near surface environment, <clears throat> particularly if, if we have a, a, a sulfide mineralization close to the water table. So that uh, can develop a redox gradient. It's going to, it, the oxidation of sulfides is an exothermic reaction. So that's going to generate heat and then buoyancy of fluids. If we, if we can get some of those ions from the oxidizing sulfide mineralization up to the VEDO zone, then there's a whole different series of, of mechanisms to get that up to the near surface environment. So uh, this is a technique that where I have done some orientation surveys, I've been convinced it's, it's working, uh, but it doesn't seem to work in the same way in every circumstance. You, you really have to, I think, develop uh, your own methodology and understanding of the system that you're working in to use it effectively. But one, where, one place I, I did apply, um, I thought had some success was at Lockington. Now, uh, Lockington is a Fosterville style um, deposit located uh, a long strike to the north of Fosterville. You can see these northerly trends that were defined uh, when Goldfields had this property. And one of the things we did, I, I did some orientation work down at O'Donnell Road. Uh, and uh, any of you that have done orientation work, and it doesn't matter whether it's geophysics or geochemistry, know. If you do an orientation survey you, and you know where the mineralization is, for sure you're going you're gonna to see it, or you're going to convince yourself you can see it. So what we did, we, we, did, we did all that, and, but then we went to another area, uh, Singer Road, and we did a blind survey. So we didn't know where these air core results were from gold fields, and so these are the pink squares shown in PPM values. And uh, we, we just tried uh, a, a short list of techniques that we had found had worked on our orientation survey. And, and one of them was uh, a bulk leach extractable gold technique. And uh, uh, we did that at what was then called Genalysis, now Intertech. And those are the, the, the blue triangles. It's, it's very low level stuff. So this is gold in parts per billion. Our highs are, are just over 2.5 ppb. Um, and the match isn't always great, but you can see I've applied a threshold to the data where we exceed that threshold. We, we're corresponding roughly to areas in the bedrock where we're seeing some gold mineralization. So I think this, this convinced me that in this particular environment, we seem to be seeing some migration of, of particularly gold, but also antimony and arsenic 
into the near surface environment from uh, quite considerable depths. I think the depth of bedrock in, in this particular area is uh, around 80 meters, if not a, a little bit more. So, so that's a little bit of a background. That's, that's some of the things that have been going on for the last couple of decades in terms of Victorian geology and some new exploration techniques. So let's have a look at what's been happening in Victoria in terms of exploration activity. And, and you can see uh, we started off with a bang and it's been downhill ever since. And of course, the, this was the low hanging fruit, um, mainly uh, alluvial and eluvial gold probably. Um, and then we went into a hiatus during the 60s when, when there was very little production in Victoria. We started to kick up again in the mid to late 80s with the development of the Stahl and Fosterville um, deposits. And then, of course, we got a, a nice little kick with discovery and development of the Swan, swan Zone. Uh, but the Swan Zone is already uh, on a, a downward trend in terms of production. And, and really what we need is a, a new stimulus to, to keep this momentum going. What it, what it did do was to generate a lot of interest in Victoria. Uh, Fosterville, uh, at, at the time that the Swan Zone was mined and developed, was owned by Kirkland Lake, uh, which is subsequently merged with another group out of Canada. Uh, and of course, Canadians were very familiar with Fosterville and a lot of Canadian companies and a lot of Canadian money has come into Victoria. This is, this is more than six months old, but really the, the rush for uh, staking exploration permits probably happened well into uh, the early part of last year. And you can see there's pretty good coverage in, in all the right neighborhoods for uh, gold exploration in Victoria now. And in the last financial year that we have records for, uh, there was a, a 184 a million dollars spent in Victoria. I know for those of you in WA, that doesn't sound like a lot of money, uh, but for Victorian geologists, that's that's a lot of cash coming in, which has allowed a lot of exploration to be done that just hasn't been done over the last 40 or 50 years due to the lack of money. So just a few words about Fosterville because every, everyone exploring in Victoria would like to find another Fosterville. And it's, it is hosted by Ordovician metasedimentary rocks. <coughs> but as I previous, previously mentioned, uh, there are these Devonian Falsing dikes that have also been mineralized. Excuse me. Um, initially, it was developed um, using heap leach uh, and uh, mining of open pits, uh, effectively uh, recovering supergene gold. Once they got down into the sulfide zone, the, the ore is quite refractory. The gold is encapsulated in pyrite and arsenopyrite. Uh, so they had to develop a biooxidation process on site uh, to break down that sulfide ore, and um, they were shuffling along fairly well at a, probably an average grade at between five and six grams per ton, uh, mining underground. When they started to, to notice uh, visible gold in some of the deeper drilling ahead of the mine development, and that developed into the, the Swan uh, load system, ultimately. And, and uh, Swan was found uh, at the, um, below the Phoenix Deep, decline. Uh, the Harrier decline is a, another structure, again, both plunging to the south. The reserves and resources uh, date back to a NI43101 report going back to 2018. Um, I haven't noticed a, a recent update, but you can see the, the average grade from Swan, 49.6 grams per ton. Uh, was a major contributor to uh, resources and reserves at Fosterville. And my estimate over the last three years is they probably pulled about uh, just shy of $4 billion worth of, of gold out uh, at, uh, they've had a pretty good run of prices, uh, say an average price of 1800 US um, per ounce. They're all in sustaining costs, they've been relatively low. 
uh, in the range three to 400, going up more recently as, as they're mining less and less of the high grain swan material. But that for a few years made Fosterville one of the most profitable, if not the most profitable gold mine in the world. And that is the reason for the interest in Victoria and the influx of money into exploration in Victoria. E79 Resources has ground in, in well, I mentioned previously um, in Beaufort, but also in Eastern Victoria, in the Myrtleford Beechworth area. Beechworth historically, if you include all the gold that uh, uh, came through uh, the Minton Beechworth, it was a significant producer of gold. The, the source of a lot of that gold is, is not particularly well defined. Um, but you can see there are a lot of a lot of veins and load systems uh, in this area to the south of, of Beechworth coming down towards Myrtleford. And we're going to have a look in detail at this area to the east of Myrtleford. Uh, for those of you that, that know Northeast Victoria, uh, a lot of gold has come out of the Ovens River. This is mainly, well, it is alluvial gold, but mainly coming from Wondilagong and Harrietville gold fields and maybe from the, the Buckland gold field as well. But the, the, this area here at Happy Valley uh, had a small amount of historical uh, hard rock production and the, the concept that E79 resources had last year was simply to drill under some of the historical workings to determine if the reason for stopping at that level was because they ran out of gold or because they ran into water. And uh, from some of the hits you can see there, uh, this is just one load system. There's another uh, semi-parallel load system as well. This is the Poor Punka Reef. There's also the new Happy Valley Reef. This is what some of the material looks like that's come out of the new Happy Valley Reef uh, and included 0.6 meters at uh, 2.4 kilograms per ton of gold. So, Obviously, the gold didn't peter out with depth. It was probably a, a case of underfinancing and an inability to, to uh, develop below the water table. Navarre Minerals um, has put out a, a, a resource for two deposits, Resolution and Adventure, to the south of Stahl on the southern margin of uh, Stahl Granite. And you can see they've, they've got about 300 ounces, averaging about 2.4 grams per ton. So this is one of the few new resources to, uh, to have been published during this current phase of enhanced exploration activity in Victoria. Catalyst Metals, they've been working on the extension of Bendigo to the north. So Bendigo sits here, as I mentioned before, it sits in the hanging wall of the White Law Fault, which runs through here. And so they've taken that corridor uh, just to the west of where they believe the White Law Fault would um, sit, come, come to, the, to the top of basement under the Murray Basin cover. And they've been exploring that zone uh, with some success at Four Eagles and Tandara. And you can see some of the numbers. Uh, what remains to be seen is, is how well this will hang together as a resource. So we haven't seen a resource yet. This is mainly 2021 drilling. Um, so some encouraging numbers, um, and it'll be interesting to see what they bring out in the future. So that's a case uh, of pursuing, uh, I guess, the knowns in terms of the historical model, which is targeting probably a uh, Benambran age mineralization. But what I'd like to just briefly finish up with is going through some of the uh, unusual deposits, particularly in Eastern Victoria, because I believe Eastern Victoria has been underexplored and the geology and the mineralization are, are not well understood. So if we go back to our structural zones, what I've done is I've superimposed the outline of the Costerfield Stibnite domain sitting on there. Um, and you can see it overlaps the outline of the Selwyn block, but it extends out to the west, probably as far as that transition between early and late Devonian magmatism. 
and I can't help but think that transition, which passes right through the town of Beaufort, which sits above there where my spotlight is. I can't help but think that that's significant in, in some respects. So, so we have that mineralogical domain, which is quite distinct. It overlaps the mineralization of the Bendigo zone. There, there's a loop out here where those, those early Devonian, sorry, late Devonian granites extend further to the east, so that boundary extends out there. We don't really have a good idea what's going on here geologically. The exposure is not particularly good. Um, we will have a better understanding. This is the Southeast Lachlan Northern Seismic Line uh, when that work comes out. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what's seen on that deep seismic. But the other thing I've shown here are, in addition to the active gold mines, some of the deposits that contain some unusual mineralogy. And, and by that, I mean either the presence of uh, sulfur salts or, or ostibite. So these are seen in a number of these deposits, seen also at Fosterville, Costerfield, uh, to a limited extent at Woods Point, probably more so associated with copper rich styles of mineralization. And then we have a whole trend of deposits ranging from King Castleus up to Granite Flat, in which we have some of these self salts. So this is a distinctive uh, mineralogical association. It's distinctive geochemically. It appears to be um, somewhat related to the same style of mineralization we see in the Costerfield Stibnite domain, uh, but it, it's sitting uh, in other mineralogical domains, which I think are not particularly well defined at the moment. So these things I, I think are quite interesting. Um, production, gold, historical gold production from all these deposits have been quite small though. So there, there haven't been any major historical producers come out of this zone. So some of the mineralization is mineralogically quite complicated. So an example here from Glen Wills, which was one of those deposits shown on the previous slide, uh, where we have gold with a relatively high silver content, say compared to a typical orogenic deposit. Uh, we have orostibite. We have a range of antimony, silver, and gold-bearing sulfur salts. And then we see uh, a very high finest gold can see a distinctively different color from our uh, uh, silver bearing um, um, alloy. And uh, it is probably due either to supergene processes or potentially even oxidation of, of the section as it's sitting in the laboratory after it's been cut. So we, we don't have a lot of constraints on when this mineralization came in, but we know it postdates and cuts through the Mount Wills granite. Uh, the Mount Wills granite is not particularly well dated. Uh, we have a whole rock Tassie Margon age uh, for it, uh, which goes back to Richards and Singleton 1981, I believe. Uh, it, so it's, it's either Silurian or it could possibly be Devonian. Um, but it does indicate that we have mineralization uh, later. It's associated with that same time frame that we see the uh, Costerfield antimony sorry, Costerfield stibnite mineralogical domain develop. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what's going on in Beaufort. So Beaufort produced about a million ounces from uh, deep lead deposits mainly and shallow alluvial workings. The um, exploration concept for Beaufort has been uh, as a potential analog from Su or Sukhoi log. Uh, which is a, a very large, uh, low-grade deposit. And I got the slide from a um, presentation given by Ross Large in 2008. And, and these are uh, the pyrite generation four. And you can see, we see some pressure shadows around them, but also the veins connecting them, which to me indicate that they're probably hydrothermal in origin. And we can see the same thing in core at Beaufort. Uh, again, we've got large hedral pyrite connect and connected uh, by these little veinlets. The nexus minerals is pick, picked up the Bethanga property in uh, the Northeast. Uh, it, historically, it's mainly a copper producer, but it also produced just over 100,000 ounces of gold. 
uh, hosted by the Silurian Bathanga granite gneiss, but also intruded by some later, probably early Devonian uh, intrusive rocks. And the model that they want to test is uh, copper gold potential at depth at Bathanga. Caroline uh, resources I uh, picked up Hill 800 and, and Rylai Creek. Here are some of their uh, recent drilling results indicating elevated uh, gold associated with copper. Um, I think they're variably looking, depending on whether it's Hill 800 or Rylai Creek, uh, looking at either porphyry copper gold or VHMS style targets. And then South Fosterville. Uh, particularly at Golden Mount, uh, had some success. Um, they've got some good numbers here through zone of mineralization, which appears to be controlled by the intersection of faults with a carbonaceous beds. And it's that same style of disseminated gold, arsenic, and chimney mineralization that we've seen at Fosterville and other places like Lockington. So just to wrap up, Historically, most of the gold in central Victoria or Victoria in general has come out of the Stahl and Bendigo zones. It looks like it probably formed early during the Benambran orogeny. And um, the oroclinal bend model suggests that that zone has then been wrapped around the northern flank of the Melbourne zone. That has some interesting um, uh, implications because it, looks like this mineralization would have been in place prior to that oroclinal bend. So what if it continued to the north, what happened to it subsequently um, is, is interesting. And uh, that happened, uh, well, actually in the later, later Ordovician and it formed the Tabor Abraham, so. I mentioned previously Fosterville early on was considered to be a bit of an oddity, but in 2016, with the discovery of the Swan Zone, uh, people have become, um, I think, impressed by the economic potential of these deposits in the Costerfield Stibnite domain. Um, they appear to be associated with middle to late Devonian phosphatism. So a uh, different timing and a different, different uh, spatial control compared to our uh, older Benambran deposits. And, and uh, they may be related to the margins of the Selwyn block, could be associated with a transition between uh, early and late Devonian Falsic magmatism. Um, it's mineralogically more complicated than the typical orogenic deposits. We have orostibite, we have sulfur salts. Uh, so again, we have a different cell target that we can look for compared to the Benambra deposits. So in terms of a, a broad scale picture of, of where I, I think gold mineralization is likely to, uh, to be best developed, I, I like that transition between the early and late Devonian felsic magmatism. It may indicate the margin of the Salwin block at depth, um, but we also need to have structurally thickened packages of Cambrian volcanic rock because that is likely the source of of where the gold has come from. And, and to sort all this out, particularly in Eastern Victoria, we're gonna need a lot more uh, detailed structural and geochronological work uh, to define the timing of some of these smaller gold deposits in the East uh, that have some of the mineralogical characteristics that look interesting, but we don't exa know exactly uh, what the big structural controls might be and exactly when they were in place. And finally, just to conclude, um, I haven't provided a list of references, but um, if I can steer you to the Association of Applied Geochemists website, um, I did put out a, a, a summary of a lot of this work with a focus on the wall rock alteration story um, about the middle of last year. It's free for download. If you go to the website, you can download a, a copy of Explore and uh, in that particular article, you'll find a lot of references, not all the ones I mentioned, but a lot of the references that have to do specifically to gold mineralization in Victoria. And all in there, and uh, I've gone a bit over time, but hopefully not too bad.